Hi, I'm Selena from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Dave Butler, or DJ Butler, as he uh, writes, as he uses on uh, his books. Um, he is a science fiction and fantasy writer. He also does write books, some books for children. Um, and um, Dave, for, for readers unfamiliar with your work, how would you describe what you write? Ah, that's really tricky. Um... I write various kinds of science fiction and fantasy. So I, I, I should caveat this. I should say mostly. I've written lots of things. I have a realistic thriller um, out there. Uh, and in fact, I just sent my agent a picture book about me and my dog. So, so there's, I, you know, it's, it's a nebulous space. Mostly what I write is um, various kinds of science fiction or fantasy um, that are in some sense really closely tied to the real world. They're in they're in uh, uh, in in Earths that look very much like ours, or in our in our own uh, in our own history. Okay, great. And what can readers expect from your newest book or newest books? So uh, yeah, well, there's a couple things I want to talk about. Uh, so um, I had this terrific book that came out last summer that it was, you know, the height of COVID, July. Uh, I don't know if that's the height, one of the heights of COVID um, and uh, sort of managed to escape everyone's notice. Um, let me talk, let me talk about that one a, a little bit. Okay. So um, it's called In the Palace of Shadow and Joy. And it's, uh, it's sort of like a Fofford and the Grey Mouser. It's a buddy comedy. It's about two guys. Um, and these two guys are both, um, uh, they're not intellectuals. They're both smart, okay? One, one of them is, uh, he's actually the epic poet of his people. He's the 427th recital thane of his people. He knows uh, the epic formula and the epithets and, and is skilled at assembling the genealogies and the tales on the fly. And it's, and it's a performative art. He, he performs the epic of his people in, you know, 50,000 uh, chanted lines. Um, but his people are dying and nobody wants to be the uh, uh, recital thing after him. So he comes, so he's come to the big city, Kish, a big old uh, rotting decadent entrepot uh, kind of like most isolated time is a million, uh, kind of like, uh, if, if you know the old Thieves' World stories, sort of sanctuary, but on a much bigger scale. Um, big, rotting, corrupt, post-imperial city, uh, and he's sort of down on his luck and making a living, uh, collecting debts for an insurance broker um, and sort of criminal overlord. Uh, and... Um, and he gets paired up by this insurance broker uh, to uh, to go bodyguard an opera singer uh, for the period of an insurance contract. And 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 the the partner he's peered uh, 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 partnered up with, fixed up with, uh, is a guy. Uh, so th so that's the poet is named Indrajit Indrajit Twang. He's tall. Uh, his head looks something like a fish. Um, and the, the other guy is named Fix. Fix is shorter and muscular and more of an ordinary human looking uh, character. And Fix is a, is a self-improver. Um, Fix, uh, and he's romantic. He's in love. He left the ashrama. He left the monastery where he was raised as an initiative, Salish Bozar the White, the god of useless knowledge, because he wanted to know useful things. And specifically, he wanted to know how to make money so he could Im impress this woman and 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 uh failed she's married with someone else uh and so he's making a living as this kind of uh off books insurance broker and thug and these guys get paired up uh, and and it becomes quickly apparent that something is wrong and and they're in fact being set up to take the fall so it's kind of like uh it's kind of like a fofford and the gray mouse for story but it's also kind of like double indemnity it's 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 a film noir around kind of crooked insurance contracts. Uh, and, and the whole thing is set visually in this kind of most Eisley because Kish is not only a, a this rotting post-imperial corrupt city, but, but it's, um, uh, its inhabitants don't know this. They don't use these, this language, but it's, it's a couple of thousand years post a gene war in which hundreds of races of different kinds of human super soldiers were created. So in Kish, they talk about the, the proverbial thousand races of man. But this is, a, this is a sort of a fantasy setting, 
but you don't have elves and dwarves. You have people who look like frogs and you have people who have scorpion bodies and you have, you know, people with second set of arms that's invisible because it changes color as they move. And um, so, uh, uh, so, so that came out and, and, uh, and, and a year ago, and it just came out uh, like, I think last week in mass market paperback in the palace of shadow and joy. That's, that's a comic uh, buddy comedy adventure, but it's also noir and it's kind of science fantasy uh, and, and it's a lot of fun. And I said, the things I write tend to be said in earth and the, the sort of, um, another thing these, and these guys never say about themselves, uh, is, uh, well, a couple things. One, they talk as if they live in a fantasy setting. They talk about magic and hexes and spells and, and they're not all of the magic you actually see on the screen. It's all weird science or weird biology. Um, so I'll give you an example. There's there's a species of one of the species of man, and they they look like frogs. And uh, and and uh, what's what's believed about them is that they have that the females are bigger and are psychically powerful. They can they can sense attackers, right? And then the males are smaller. But that turns out not to be true. There's actually the the females are bigger. But the males are like little tadpole sized things that are embedded in the female's back where she is feeding them. And also they are fertilizing her eggs or like in this jelly on her back. And, and what people take to be the males are actually males that have fallen off, grown to maturity and, and become sexless. And they, and they go around acting as interpreters for the females who can't, who don't have vocal cords that can, uh, vocalize ordinary human speech and where the females apparent psychic abilities come from is they have all these males on their back with outward facing eyes and when something comes to sneak up behind them the males quiver in fear and so the females know they're being attacked right so there's these valued huge hulking warriors that are very difficult to surprise but it's not it's all biology right so uh so that's and then the other thing is there it's actually set in future earth it's 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 not a it's not a fantasy world. There are a couple of I don't know, a handful of hints in the story that ah, this is actually you know this is Earth after a post you know future genetic war, forced genetic diversification kind of event. So um, so that's sort of my newest. It's that's my newest book one, and it just came out in uh, in mass market paperback this month. Great. Okay, and. Um... What do you think draws readers to these kinds of books? Man, that is a good question. Um, I do not know. Uh, and uh, I'm at great risk of uh, flattering myself. Um, Go ahead. Let me, let me yeah. <laughs> well, say this. I've never met one of my readers that I didn't like. I, I have friends who are writers who write books and then I meet one of their readers and they kind of go, Ugh. I've never had that experience. Every time I've met a reader, I thought that's a, she is interesting. That is an interesting guy, right? And um, uh, what I am trying to write, there's this, there's this space. I, I read an interview with Neil Stevenson talking about this maybe 15 years ago. And he was talking at the time, and I think this is probably still true, he was describing this as a shrinking space. He said there's less and less space for books that are, um, that are not self-consciously literary fiction, but they are smart, right? It's a, it's a, it's a rollicking yarn that has an idea in it uh, that is trying to appeal to people with you know, maybe a sophisticated sense of humor. Uh, or requires some, you know, or, or ha has more layers, more accessible layers, the more knowledge you bring to it, right? That's, that's the space I want to write in. Um, you know, writers who like, who, who I would like to emulate include Neil Stevenson, uh, and also Tim Powers, uh, for example. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's, so that's, that's what I put in there. So hopefully, hopefully the reason that I, or I don't know, maybe the reason why I find that I get along with my readers is because maybe that's what they're finding, right? Maybe, maybe we are successfully connecting. 
Okay, so uh, let's talk about your um, your mass market paperback um, in the shadow. Um, what was the inspiration for it? Um, that is a good question. I uh, a friend of mine named Steve Peck is a biology professor and a and a novelist. He's got I want to say four or five novels out um, with sort of smaller Western presses uh and uh and i actually attended a lecture steve gave about no it was two lectures uh i say attended he he gave them my house we have a big room okay actually here's another detour here's a little detour and i've got the portable camera so i can show you here's a fun fact for book people okay fun piece of trivia for book people um so do you know the name Stephen R. Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Affected People, right? Yeah. Sold like a bazillion copies. Okay, here's here's the fun, irrelevant trivia. I'm looking around because the room's a little dark, so this is going to be tricky. But he, here's the trivia. Um, the house that Emily and I own and that I'm sitting in right now is the original Sandra and Stephen R. Covey home that they built in 1958. Wow. And yeah, when they sold a billion books, then they moved, they built a castle and moved to it, right? But they used to, they built this house first. And uh, and the room I'm sitting in right now actually has has never been, uh, has never been renovated. It's actually Stephen's office. So this like wooden panel is the wooden panel Stephen R. Covey put in in 1958. And that's his popcorn style plaster ceiling. And I'll see if we can see this. That's, that's hard to tell. It's green shag carpet. And it's green shag carpet. And it's the original uh, 60 plus year old green shag carpet Steve Covey put in. So so this is it. This is the room where Seven Habits was written. Now, where, where am I going with that? Uh, they eventually had eight kids. So they built this, they, they put on additions. This is a big sprawling old kind of falling apart house. And it has a huge room. And we use that room to uh, invite people over to give lectures and we invite the public. And we've had people lecture on all kinds of stuff. Uh, Russian history was the first. We've had poets do readings. We had uh, an Irish folk uh, tale artist come and tell stories. We had a guy come and demonstrate lithography techniques, so, uh, all kinds of stuff. And, um, and one thing is this guy, Steve Peck, we had him come over and he gave two lectures. Um, and, uh, and one of them was about predators. What do, uh, what do science fiction and fantasy movies get wrong about, about predator species? Uh, and the other was about, uh, about human, uh, or not human, about, about intelligent biology. When we encounter other species, what are, what do we, uh, like from other planets, what should we what does biology tell us we should expect? What are the, what seem to be the most likely possibilities, right? And so I, we had Steve over and he gave these lectures and I was sitting here listening and thinking about this. And I, and, and, and I, I just thought, you know, this is um, all this biology stuff, right? There's so much room, uh, there's so much kind of unexplored space around this well, in sci-fi, but man, especially in fantasy, you know, it's always, humans elves dwarves halflings or something close to that the she fairies right like it's uh, but there's but if you just look around um i actually started subscribing to national geographic at that point right if you just look at the species on earth and what they do in terms of some of them are are poisonous as a defense and some of them are venomous and some of them can fly and right and I, and i and i started thinking about what would a fantasy setting look like uh that um that took took biology rather than folktale as the starting point for what its species uh, should look like, um, which is a little audacious because I'm not a scientist at all. Uh, so you know, like everything, I, I'm in over my head. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, but yeah, but that was that that was the basic that was the starting point for it. Okay, and, and then what kind of research went into writing it? 
So, uh, so for that one, actually, I'm probably going to change gears on you here because I want to tell a story about a different book. But, but I will say that that for that book, actually, reading National Geographic is sort of the thing that I have most consistently done. In fact, not even read it. I do what I think most people do. I look at the pictures and read the captions, and then once in a while, I go look at the article and say, oh, "What is the article actually saying?" Uh, you know, uh, at species of you know cuttlefish or uh, you know octopus or or whatever. Uh, you know lemurs um, are being photographed and I'll you know jot down notes. should have a species that does x um, so that's 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 the main thing but but I actually I did a ton of research for another quite recent novel and I want to I want to switch gears and talk about that so um, co-written with Aaron Michael Ritchie I have two books out in a series um, the first book is called The Cunning Man and the second book is called The Jupiter Knife and these are set in uh, 1935, and they're set in Utah. And the main there there there's sort of two main characters. Uh, there's a there's a farmer. Hiram Woolley is uh, in his 40s. He's a sugar beet farmer. He drives a Ford Model AA pickup truck, uh, and wears heart, Red Wing harvester boots and overalls. He's a great war veteran, and he is a wizard. Uh, he practices his grandma Hetty's traditional magical lore, and um, and he uh, and so part of the research for that um, that whole series is reading grimoires. I have like a shelf full of actual real world uh, spell books now because one of the things we wanted to do is we said, hey, no fireballs. Uh, we're gonna. He's only gonna do things that we can find evidence that somebody did right somebody thinks they did someone wrote this down a spell book there's some account of this um and actually book one the uh the uh uh the cunning man one way to see it is that the entire book from the from chapter two to the very last chapter the whole thing is one slow motion wizard's duel between this farmer Hiram Woolley and a shopkeeper who is also a wizard but a little more malevolent using real world spells so um uh but book two Okay, in book two, so uh, the, the other main character is Hiram's adopted Navajo son, Michael. And, uh, and, and Michael is, Hiram is smart, but he's not really a book person. Um, he, he only knows English. Um, he has written materials, but mostly he knows techniques and, that his, his grandma taught him. Uh, and his son, Michael, is, is smarter than Hiram and is 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 very much a book guy and and really sort of is destined to probably become a scientist or something like that mm -hmm. and um and in book one he's very skeptical about the whole magic thing uh but but by the end sort of sees that things are happening and he can't really deny them and in book two book two is called the jupiter knife and it's about an it's about astral magic, star star magic, and about uh, a, a, was this, I'm giving a lot of spoilers here today, and a werewolf cult. Okay, it's a, it's a sort of a werewolf cult, and um, so uh, so we had to go figure out a lot about the actual positions of the planets in 1935 and how we wanted to make things work uh and uh so the idea is that there is this there's this uh set of daggers uh that uh channel the the power of, of this the planet jupiter jupiter is the king it's you know it's leadership power and and uh uh the power of rule to whoever's carrying the knife um on the uh on the nights when the the planet Jupiter crosses one of the decans, now there, there are twelve constellations on the zodiac. Really, there's thirteen, but we don't count Ophiuchus. Okay, so there's twelve, uh, and and conceptually, each one of them is thirty degrees, and so a decan is a ten degree span. It's a third of a of a constellation of a of a zodiac constellation, conceptually. And so the idea was because Jupiter takes about a year, 
I'm, I'm oversimplifying because there's also like periods of retrocession and stuff, but okay. We really had to do the research on this, right? So uh, <laughs> conceptually about three times a year, Jupiter crosses one of these points, one of these lines, and the idea with those those were nights when this werewolf pack would go out and there would, you know, the leaders would channeling the power of these daggers. And um, and so uh, so we we had sort of figured this out conceptually and not done the math. And we had picked this day in June and we we're like, okay, and this is gonna happen, and they have to go see the crazy guy preaching. So this has to happen on a Sunday. Ugh. I, we're going to have to make this work with the with the with the astronomy, though, right? So late in the process, I go to actually figure it out, and I go to do the math, and I find that uh, not only is the the day that we had landed on actually, in fact, the day in which Jupiter crossed one of the decans, right? So like we had lucked on the right day, but also that was uh, the night of a full moon. Sorry, a new moon and a solar eclipse and we realized that 1935 was a so-called maximal year a year that had the most number of eclipses you can possibly have in a year which is five solar and two lunar we had accidentally chosen a year with the most possible eclipses and the weekend on which the first book was set was also a solar eclipse which uh which, which fortunately we had there being like snowstorms, so you wouldn't have seen it anyway, right? So, uh, so, so astrology is true. Um, first of all, uh, this is what I discovered, and uh, uh, and but that involved a lot of like uh, getting out star tables and thinking through, uh, you know, uh, how how this would work uh, with the movements of the planet uh, Jupiter. Uh, as well as going back into old star magic uh, texts like the Picatrix to say, you know, how, what kinds of things do you do to channel the influence of Jupiter and what is the influence of Jupiter? So that book is, that sounds all really cerebral and nerdy. It's about a guy in overalls fighting a werewolf cult in the desert. Uh, it is high action, uh, fun, sometimes even very funny, but it's got some real, we really worked hard to nail down to make the astral magic work to fit the astronomy of the real world. Wow. So is that your favorite research story or do you have another favorite research story? Man, I I think I think that's my favorite research story. It is, is discovering is discovering that we had accidentally picked such interesting and useful dates. Uh, I think that's my favorite. Yeah. Okay. Um, what was the biggest challenge in writing and putting out um, your your newest book? You can choose which one you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, man, I don't know. That's interesting. You know, I feel like, um, so I've got a great relationship with Bain. I, I, I've had several publishers and man, there's a whole, you know, I don't know. I don't know who, who, We'll watch an interview like this to the extent that there are people out there who are thinking I'm going to try to make it as a novelist. Man, just be ready. You you know, the amount of stuff, the amount of setbacks and like, I didn't see that coming. You know, I, 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 I've been ghosted by a publisher. I've been gaslit by a publisher. I've been dumped by an agent. My wife had a publishing contract and the publishing company decided that they were done with the United States and they they paid her and printed up the arcs and then walked and just took their toys, went back to Sweden. So like just, man, bad stuff happens. But my experience with Bain has been great. Um, you know, it's a fallen world. Nothing's perfect. So so I feel like, you know, I, I have I've had once I got connected with Bain, um, I've been able to, you know, um, been able to sell books. I've been able to have great conversations with the publisher and, you know, figure out what, what kind of books, you know, will sell. Uh, and uh, like that, that has all not been a problem. That's not been a challenge. For me, the challenge is always on the, um, on the side of uh, making the, the time to write the book. Um, like many 
novelists. Uh, I have, I have, uh, for you aspiring writers, I hear here's more depressing. Here's the, here's, the, here's a depressing thing to think about. I have 10 traditionally published novels out, right? I am still working for a living. Uh, and uh, right, that's how it goes, most writers. Um, so uh, the challenge for me is always, make, is, is always getting the book out. Uh, and it's just the difficulty of, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I work, but it's a sort of an unpredictable schedule. Uh, and so it's trying to find chunks of time, which I can write a lot or make myself write little amounts, um, with, you know, sort of little notice or preparation. Oh, I have two hours free. Uh, I can sit down and write eight pages right now. Um, that's that's the hard part for me. Everything else has been, uh, you know, relatively easy. Mm -hmm. um, in your books, um, what character did you love or hate the most when you were writing? Um, that's a good question. I, I actually still so that that sugar beet farmer Hiram Woolley. By the way, I'm wearing a fedora. I don't I don't wear hats going around town in my ordinary life. I wear hats about when doing book stuff. And I wear hats that relate to the books. Hiram Woolley wears a fedora. This is my Hiram Woolley hat. So he's the sugar beet farmer from Lehigh, Utah. And, um, and he's, uh, it's a delight to write him. Um, he's, uh, he's complicated. Um, he stands, uh, across a number he's very he's a very liminal man he's a person of the threshold he stands across a lot of thresholds okay um he's living in the 1930s so he you know he grew up pre-jazz age so his roots are in the 19th century right and yet he's in an age of great economic and social transformation and including things like mechanization and, and changing size and scope of government right um but also the sort of lore he learned as a child which was seen as very ordinary ordinary kinds of charms and uh, uh you know uh sort of divinations you would do reading tea leaves kind of stuff is now being seen and treated as uh as magic uh he really grew up surrounded by women so his father abandoned him uh it's utah in the 30s so his father's a polygamist and his mother is the, an unfavored wife and his father abandons them so he grows up with his mother and his grandmother surrounded by women but they are now both dead and it's him and his adopted son and so there is he's living he's grew up in this world of women he's living in this in this world of men so he's he's um uh so he's sort of conscious you know of the complicated nature of the world at all times and and what he wants to do this is a guy who is a veteran of the great war and he's a farmer and and his is the reason why he's he's out using his magical lore to fight evil is not that it comes looking for him it's that he has a personal quest to help the the widows and the fatherless he wants to he wants to help the poor and we and we see him and it's the great depression there's a lot of opportunity to help the poor and we see him the reason uh he gets involved in book one uh with um what ultimately turns out to be this demon down the bottom of a mine uh is that the mine is closed uh and the, the miners are are you know beginning to jump trains and leave uh and and there's these families there that are that are stuck in this uh this real place spring canyon outside of helper utah um, without any means of of living right and so he's actually delivering he we, sh he we see him he's got a truckload of groceries he's delivering food uh and then he gets involved in this you know what the heck is going on uh fight uh book two the reason he's out in moab utah under the hot sun uh as we see him he's, he and michael have a dousing rod and they're trying to place a well because there's a farmer out there of spanish canyon outside of moab needs water right so they're and they're out there trying to find a well for him to have water right so um and and, and we get letters actually aaron and i get letters and and emails where people say things like 
thank you so much for writing a story about a about a good person, a person who is self-consciously trying to do good things. He's 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 not close to an anti-hero, right? He's complex, but there's no there's no hidden rage inside him. There's no like, you know, uh, fits of of uh, of uh, uh, sudden violence or whatever. He you know, he's he's in control of himself. He's understated. He's always thinking about others. Uh, he's extremely shy and sort of goofy and awkward around women. Um, and and it's just it's just wonderful to write him. You okay, know? great. That yeah. sounds good. Is there anything um, else that you wanted to, to say about your newest book? Uh, your, your latest book. My latest book, yeah. Uh, please go buy them all. Uh, <laughs> it's about, I feel like I've given way too long answers already, so I will say that. Please go buy them all. They are available wherever you can buy books. Okay, sounds good. Um, what else can we expect from you in the near future? So my next novel coming out, I just sold uh, a science fiction novel uh, to Bain. This will come out in the summer, um, and it's called Abbott in Darkness. Um, and it is a um, uh, so if you read the history of the early multinational companies like the East India Com Com uh, Company or the Hudson Bay Company. OK, so we're talking about like 15, 16, 1700s here. So what happened is these companies, uh, but it's especially the East India Company, maybe. Um, they, uh, they had just a profit motive. They were out there to make money, but they sort of became governments because they were so far away from home, there was no oversight, right? And this is where we really got into problems uh, and, and, and real abuse. So, um, so Abbott and Darkness is a, it's a future, but it's nearish future in which uh, the slow time to travel between stars results in something like a return to the age of sail. So there's a, there's a planet, it's at the end of the wormhole, it's about six months journey from Earth, and the planet is completely dominated, owned basically, by a United States corporation, uh, which, is, which is exploiting the planet's wealth. Uh, and it's about a, and, 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 and traders for this company, it's called the Saravar company, get rich because, and this is what was true of the East India company too, is, is the company doesn't pay you that much, but you're allowed to trade for your own account. So you go there and you buy stuff that they make on the planet and you sell it and you make yourself rich while the company gets rich. So it's fabulously attractive. And it's about, uh, a, a young accountant. He's in his 20s. Uh, he's just out of school. He's married. He has two small kids and a dog. And they're in debt up to their eyeballs. And they've moved to this planet to make their career. And he realizes that it is corrupt and that there is theft going on and there is a gun running going on and worse. And sort of the question for him is, you know, how do I do this? I can't go home. There's no going back. You know, I've mortgaged everything to get here. I have to make a career here uh, without becoming corrupt myself. And so, and where that really comes from is that is, is really it's sort of East India Company, uh, mm -hmm. rewritten science fiction. So that's okay. Abbott, Darkness out next summer. Great. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you some questions about being a writer. What's your favorite part of being a writer on the whole writing and uh, publishing process? Uh, it is really wonderful to meet a stranger and have that person say, uh, you're so-and-so, I read your book X and it, you know, whatever. It meant a lot to me. It was really, you know, it, it was important to me. Uh, it really helped me in a dark time or I laughed my head off, right? It's, a, it's amazing that you get to touch people that you never see. Uh, and the fact that you rarely have someone say that to you mean it just means that there's people out there in the world that you are never going to see in your whole life who who read your book and now there's some people who read your book and like that guy's an idiot but also who read your book and are thinking this is wonderful right uh, and that's um, and that's amazing great and what do you consider the most challenging uh, part of the writing process um it, you know, for me, it is it, the most challenging thing. It's not, it's not having ideas. It's not figuring out the, the, uh, the shape of a novel. 
it, for me at this time, it is just finding the time. Um, and uh, for me, that's the hardest thing. Yeah. It's hard to sell. I, I guess the other thing, well, I don't know. This is it's not that it's hard to do selling work. File this under more depressing things to know as an up and coming writer. Um, most of the time when your books come out, you know, uh, they just, it's a slow grind. You're slowly reaching your audience. Very few people put out their first book and whoa, Harry Potter, right? Well, one person did that, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Right. And that's what every writer thinks is going to happen. And it just doesn't. And I, I know so many writers who are able to do the work and who will put out two or three books and then just quit because the whole um, sticking it out, creating a backlist, doing it for 20 years and and then maybe finally getting enough kind of volume that you can do it full time. Just they could not could not do it. There's a Kurt Vonnegut quote where he says something like the business uh, uh, writing is not for people who are good at writing. Writing is for people who have the ability to survive in the writer's life. Uh, and Interesting. I, I think that's true. That's a great quote. <laughs> okay. What has been your favorite adventure during your writing career? Oh, I have so many good ones. Um, he, here's a here's a fun one though so so my my day job is corporate training and in the last year and a half that's meant a lot of zoom okay but but previous to that it was 90 percent of it was face to face so i traveled a ton and and one of the things i would do uh is i started going everywhere i went i kept track of them i went, I went into all the barnes and nobles and i would go there and find my books and sign them so I had literally been into about 46, just over 46% of the existing Barnes and Nobles when COVID made them all shut down. And now the number has changed. So I'm not keeping track anymore. But at that point, almost half of the Barnes and Nobles in the country. And, 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 uh, and there was this one time in Bloomington, Indiana. And I was there to teach a class and I walk into the Barnes and Noble and I, I, I did my thing. I go to the, the fantasy section and, and there weren't any books. So I had a copy of a book in my hand to, to give as a gift. So I walked up to the customer service desk and said, hey, I'm a writer. I'd love to give this to one of you. And I don't see that you have any of my books in stock, but if you could order them in, that'd be great. And they, they look and they go, oh, no, we have your book in stock. We, we have copies of Witchy out here. And we, I said, oh, uh, well, I didn't see them. Let's go find them. So we go out and we, we look around the store and they're not in, they're not in fantasy sci-fi and we of the young young adult i don't know literary we go we, we can't find it we go back to customer service and, and, and i'm saying things like well you know it's possible someone shoplifted the book i don't know i hope not but um uh she says well hold on let me just double check and she pulls up the record and says oh no the reason we haven't found it i'm sorry this is my bad is actually it was ordered by somebody and uh and she has yet to pick it up there's a copy sitting in the back room and i said well i said let's call her and see if she wants me to sign the book. And they said, okay, fine. So, so I'm in a Barnes and Noble and I call this woman, her name's Barbara. And I, and I say, hi, Bar is this Barbara? She says, yes. I said, do you, did you order a copy of a book called Witchy? I, she says, yes. I said, this is gonna sound weird. I'm the author. I'm standing at the Barnes and Noble. I'm here completely by coincidence. Would you like me to sign this book for you? And, and she says, this is a Christmas gift for my father. Can you, you know, can you, and, and so I had this great conversation with her. She's like, I read the book. Here's what I loved about it. it was fantastic. Can you sign it for my dad? So I'm like signing the book. And that was just a wonderful, um, just a wonderful kind of heartwarming experience. You have so many, so many experiences of frustration in the, in, in this career. That was, that was a moment of delight. Oh, that sounds, that, that's a great story. <laughs> She must have been absolutely thrilled. <laughs> and out of nowhere, right? Slightly weirded out. Like, what a weird coincidence. Yeah, really? So what's the greatest lesson that you've learned uh, thus far in your career? Uh, man, Writing that's career. <laughs> yeah. Yes, because I've had several careers. Uh, <laughs> um. So um, 
well, okay, so let me say two things. And these are sort of different kinds of lessons. Here's lesson one. As a writer, I think the basic lesson is never give up. You, no one can stop you. You can, especially now, the tools for self-publishing and the independent options are greater than ever. You gotta be careful. You gotta look at who you're doing business with and what, what the terms are. But fundamentally, no one can stop you. You can only choose to stop, right? Um, is it was like the lesson for a writer, um, but but there's there's another thing I want I so um, okay I'm not going to name names because I'm, I'm not going to name names but 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 I th there's a big writer I know uh, who writes uh, tie-in kind of novels okay novels that would be sort of easy to dismiss as like uh, you know that's that's not literature. It's just tie-in novels for you know that property over there. Um, and I have a couple times, and he's a cool guy. I like him. Uh, and I, I have a couple times been at a booth with him at Comic Con, um, and uh, I have never seen so many people come up to a writer and say. Uh, I was thinking about suicide when I was a teenager until I read your book, these tie-in and your, your character in the game tie-in novels, you know, uh, made it so I could get it through high school. And, and, and I just, uh, you know, this is like not a lesson for writers, really. I don't know who it's a lesson for. Maybe everybody, but you just, you know, no, nobody's, nobody's taste in literature is to be dismissed. Nobody's writing bad books or useless books. You never know what book is going to save somebody's life, you know, and um, and that's sort of, you know, maybe it'll be your book, right? Um, but maybe it'll be a book that you and your heart kind of want to sneer at. So, um, you know, that was a, that was a big lesson to me as a, as a person, really. Wow. That, uh, that is an incredible story also. Wow. Yeah. You do, you, you never know. You never know. Everybody's tastes are totally different. Yeah. Yeah. So what piece of advice would you want to share with other writers? Well, never give up. I already said that. Watch yeah. who you do business with. Um, I would say, uh, let me say, let me say two other things. Uh, and I, I love how you said the question. So two things. One, um, you remember that with the act of writing is entrepreneurial. You write a, a book, you are starting a small business. You need to think like an owner. You're not looking for a job. You're not somebody's employee. You're the owner. So you have to worry about What's my brand? What's my production schedule? You know, who do I want to do business with? That stuff's all on you. And I think, I think, I think you do yourself a disservice if you don't realize that um, early. Uh, but the other thing, and, and I'm glad, Selena, the way you asked the question, you said other writers. Uh, so I, I have uh, many times people will say, hey, what's your advice for aspiring writers? And the first thing I say is stop calling yourself an aspiring writer. That's the first thing you got to do because, because look, in this business, you're, you're not competing for people's dollars. The dollars is the least valuable part. It's their attention. You're saying, give me three or five hours of your time, right? And that's worth way more than the price of the novel, right? Even if they buy the big mm -hmm. hardback book, the, ex the expensive thing they're giving you is five hours of time. And, um, and, and the people, um, although they don't, they don't mean to be this way, right? But, it, but people are looking for a reason to not pay you any attention. Uh, and, and if you give them a signal that says this person is not worth paying attention to, they'll take it. So don't say I'm an aspiring writer uh, because that says I'm not a writer. Uh, you don't need to worry about me. I won't take any of your attention, right? So don't say that, say I'm a writer. And if they say, what, well, what do you write? Then you say, oh, well, I, I write, uh, you know, uh, vampire uh you know mystery romances oh are, and you know where can i have your stuff well i'm still working on getting published right let them find that out don't tell anybody you're aspiring or you only have you know never never cut yourself down the world is going to do plenty of cutting down 
for you. Very true. So are there any clubs, groups, or organizations that you would recommend to, uh, to other writers that have helped you in your career? Uh, you know, that's interesting. Um, uh, no, come a but. Okay. So here, here's my experience. My experience with organizations that exist for writers and this cannot be universally true this is just my experience mm -hmm. is whenever i get inside them i feel like i am in a pyramid scheme and what's happening is i am being invited to contribute my time and money to promoting the founders of the pyramid scheme and uh i cannot abide that so um i i have a deep uh anarcho libertarian streak in me and i like horizontal organizations and so what i have done is found uh organizations um i'll give you three examples one hey we invite people over to our house every quarter i already mentioned this we we mm -hmm. and mostly they're writers they're not all writers but mostly they're writers or some other kind of artist and um i don't charge them i don't charge admission i make the house available as a venue uh, in fact, I pay because I provide uh, milk and I bake brownies for everyone. So I put money into it to provide a venue. Uh, it's it's purely uh, it's purely horizontal. I don't say, "Hey, Jared, you're going to do a reading in my house later on. You got to do something for me." I never I never say that. But you're building horizontal strategic relationships. People do come back, not always, but often they do come back and help you. Um, Another thing is uh, I have a, I, I use the house, we do a writing retreat in the spring and I get eight or 10 people over here and they just come stay a week and I don't charge them and I don't lecture to them. And that's just a space where you can come write. And again, I'm trying to build just horizontal relationships. I'm not anybody's war chief. You don't pay me any money. You don't have to promote my stuff. In fact, I'll promote you. But I, I believe that, uh, that in, uh, uh, when I, when you help people, right, many of them will, I, it comes back. I believe you get more help in the long run. Some people don't help you back. They just think, oh, he helped me because I'm awesome and deserved it. But, but many people will come back and, and give you more than you ever gave them. Uh, there's, there's another thing. So I, I need to resume these. I haven't done these for 18 months. But I, another thing I did once a quarter, and this started with a friend of mine uh, who was on online, like in a Facebook group. Uh, that related to one of these other kind of writing clubs. And, uh, and she posted and said, I, I'm really kind of frustrated with my career. I'd love to get some kind of career consulting. Does anybody know who offers that kind of advice? And five people immediately jumped up, offered to charge her money for their advice. And, and I said, I said, hey, listen, uh, before we do that, what if we just meet at an IHOP? I said, are there other takers? What if I just what if we just went to an IHOP one day and everyone who wanted to showed up and we could just talk about writing stuff? Would that be cool? And, uh, and like 30 or 40 people said yes. So, uh, so I called the IHOP and warned them and said, you know, on Saturday at two o'clock, we're going to show up with like 40 people-ish. I can't control it, you know, something like 40 people. Uh, we'll come when it's not your, your rush hour so that hopefully it'll work out for you. And we, it was great. People came, they, people signed book contracts there and they talked about their publications and they shared advice and they wanted to do it again. And so the next time I called IHOP and said, listen, I'm going to show up with like 40 people. Can you give everybody 10% off? And they said, yes. And so um, we showed up at IHOP and everybody got, you bought your own food. Nobody was in charge. Nobody paid anybody else, but people, you know, got in anthologies together and they, you know, and, and agreed to co-write books. And, and so um, I'm a big believer in organizations. And my experience is that when you go out and find existing organizations, often they want to take you in as their grunt labor. And I just be careful with that. Um, I think in the long run, you need to be building your own, uh, your own networks. Okay, that's great. Um, now I have questions about you as a person. Um, what? <laughs> What's the one thing that most people don't realize about you? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, that they don't realize about me. Yep. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, I don't know. I feel 
like I'm a fairly open book, but I will tell you, I'll tell you, a, I'll tell you a little known factoid. How about that? This is okay. not a good answer to your question, but it's kind of in the space. Uh, here is a fun, true fact about me. Um, I once wrote and recorded um, a theme song for Walmart. I sent every member of the board of directors of Walmart a CD. They gave me a twenty to five dollar gift certificate to Walmart uh, in exchange. <laughs> oh, that's great. I also I noticed that you do um, you do a number of recordings. Oh yeah. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So so I um, I'm bad. Uh, I play guitar. I'm 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 almost yes. mediocre as a guitar player. I'm really bad as a banjo and mandolin player. We have recording equipment in the house. Uh, and um, so I go to events when they have some um, some way to accommodate this. I play music to to as part of what I do. Right. So as part mm -hmm. of like what is what is my brand? Uh, how do people remember me? Oh, that's the guy who got up and sang. So at like filk circles, I'll do it. Or um, I was the guest of honor at um fantasy in may and they gave me an hour to do whatever i want i just put on a concert i got up and played like 12 songs uh and gave away stacks of free books uh which is also part of my brand giving away lots of lots of free books you follow my mailing list and you'll see like every month there's a five book giveaway five people win a stack of five books and then interim things have free audiobooks so um and uh, so, so I try and perform publicly kind of in the fandom space. Uh, I, I, and I record. Um, uh, in fact, for a lot of years while I was working as a full-time lawyer before I decided it was time to go take up novel writing, uh, one of the creative things I would do is write songs and record them. I, I wrote uh, an album of songs for my, at the time, all the nieces and nephews I had. And it was called the album title was Stop Singing, Crazy Uncle Dave. Uh, and, uh, and I wrote a song for every one of them. And they just, they got a CD for Christmas. So um, uh, one of the fun things I did is, I should say fun for me. I have no, you know, readers have never complained about this. But, but uh, in my epic fantasy series, The Witchy War, Witchy Eye, Witchy Winter, Witchy Kingdom, Serpent Daughter, there are songs. As it, as it happens, there's about an album's worth of songs on each of those books. And so for the first book, I recorded an album and, and it is out there. I release it. In fact, I just got my first Spotify royalty payment. Uh, I, just, I just, after like three years, earned $20 off of Spotify. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, I have, I have been delayed in this. The album for book two is... is um, maybe 75% complete. I need to sort of knuckle down, spend a weekend and, and put that one out. So um, yeah, music is uh, music, but especially music with words. Lyrical music is very important to me. Um, I think it's very, uh, the kind of way lyrics are written, the kind of care that is applied to song lyrics is really important to kind of how I think about good writing. Um, and just a lot of like, you know sort of pithy ideas that matter to me like i express them most easily in a in a song lyric and even somebody else's song lyric right so songs are meaningful to me so um so i've incorporated them into my writing there's other series that have music in them too but especially the witchy war is basically one album per book mm -hmm. yeah and i noticed um that there are some of them are available on amazon yep yeah, <laughs> I, have, I have a CD on Amazon. It's yes, correct. you do. <laughs> okay, so what is or are your passions when you're not writing, and how do you make time for your non-writing hobbies and things that you love? You said you have a hard time writing, you know, making time for for writing. So how do you make time for hobbies? Uh, I'm I'm fortunate that my day job stuff is reasonably not time consuming. It's sort of variable. Sometimes it's in the middle of the night, which can mess you up, but it's, it's, it's sort of a surprisingly small number of hours. Um, so uh, I like to spend a lot of time with my family. My wife and I have three, and, and my three kids. Uh, one of the things we do 
is we go hiking a lot. So we went uh, this last Thursday um, up to the High Line Trail, which is a 50 mile trail across the Uinta Mountains. In the whole world, there are only two mountain ranges that run east west. Uh, if you look on a map, they always go like they're always north south. There are two that go east west. One is the Himalayas, and the other is the Uinta Mountains on the Utah Wyoming border. And we went up and the High Line Trail goes across those. We went up on Thursday and just kind of hiked six and a half miles down the trail and six and a half miles back. So uh, spending time with my kids is something I love to do. Um, uh, we got a dog. I don't know if I would say the dog is one of my passions, but she's definitely, she's, she's a, uh, you know, it's a good dog. I like my dog. Uh, she's, she's a time consuming obligation. Um, so this morning I have already walked the dog and I will walk her again tonight because the kids are a little hit and miss on whether they are up for it. Uh, so it defaults to me. Um, I, uh, I love games. Um, I love in, in a particular tabletop role playing game. So I have a, a gaming group, which is uh, man, uh, my, my son, um, one of my brothers uh, in the group. They're my best friend from sixth grade, who I'm still in touch with. Some of the guys I play with from high school, we get together um, every two to four weeks uh and uh, and play and we're playing a, a classic science fiction role-playing game now called traveler and the uh the heroes have have become privateers they're they're doing lots of pirate adjacent things uh not quite pirates but you know stealing ships from other pirates for example as you know we're not really pirates but close um the kind of stuff that happens um i love reading uh i i read widely and sometimes uh strangely so what am i reading right now i think the three things i'm reading right now are uh the most recent biography of andrew jackson um and i just started the second novel in um uh, the first book is The Three Body Problem. What's the author's name? Qi Xin Liu, something like that. Qi Xin Li, Chinese I'm writer, sure. won, won the Hugo. I, I forget the first. Anyway, I just started book two and I've just started it. So I forget what the name of the book. Maybe it's The Dark Forest or something like that. I'm only about five pages in. I just started it yesterday, uh, which is sort of a it's sort of a little bit Lovecraft, but also first contact. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I find, yeah. Um, and I'm reading the, the collected books of Charles Hoy Fort. Um, Charles Fort was an early to mid 20th century guy um, who, who basically he collects in these, it's like four volumes and he collects weird stuff like, on May 27th, 1882, uh, frogs rained out of a clear sky onto the city of Leeds in England, right? And here's the reference for it. And, and uh, he's sort of obsessed with the idea that, um, you know, uh, that's, that the science, or at least science as he understood, or science of his day, uh, achieved uniformity by excluding everything weird that didn't fit in. And he wanted to look at the weird stuff and say, you know, uh, there's something wrong with our science here. It's not taking into account all of these things. So what it really ends up being is this, this compendium of really weird data, uh, unexplained footprints uh, in stone and, uh, you know, weird things falling out of the sky. Uh, I'm in a chapter now where he's talking about in book two about visions, people having visions of marching soldiers or visions of cities uh, in the sky and there's all these recorded instances you know people said oh i saw i saw a city in the air or i saw troops marching uh so mm -hmm. uh yeah it's just kind of a compendium of weird stuff charles fort is his name so mm -hmm. i love reading I love okay reading. um what does your writing space look like um and what do you need to have around you when you're writing or, or editing Oh, good question. So this is uh, this is a one uh, area where I am very good, which is to say, I'm not always good at making myself do it when I should. But I don't I don't need things or places. I mean, this is this is my office. This is my writing space. You know, it's just a little 
rickety old office with what it mostly is full of is books, right? Um, and, well, I have some hats, uh, but uh, <laughs> ah, that's not good. Uh, but uh, but I actually don't need that stuff to write. I, I um, have written many many chapters sitting on an airplane or sitting in uh, airport lounges or sitting on the uh, couch at a uh, you know, friend's house or sitting in shotgun of a car while Emily, my wife, or somebody else you know, drives us uh, cross country. I, I'm very good at that. Um, the thing that is most helpful to cause me to write, to really be like, oops, now I have to do it, is deadlines. Like the knowledge that somebody is waiting really takes away you know, mortally wounds my ability to procrastinate. That's, that's the essential thing for me. Uh huh. And do you normally like, um, write in silence or do you like music when you're writing or can you write anywhere? You said you were starting to say that. I, I ordinarily just write in silence. I don't, I don't use writing soundtracks. I know lots of people who do and get a lot of value out of that. Right. Um, and I'm pretty good at writing when there's noise around, when there's, you know, work, workers in the house doing things or my kids are playing, you know, we dance party in the other room. I, I usually can write right through that. So that's what that's one of my strengths as a writer. Hmm. And do you need to have any food or drink or um, or things like that with you? Um, coffee, water? It would be better if I didn't do those things. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but the truth is that I tend to have uh, some caffeine. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if I'm being good, my caffeine is usually diet Mountain Dew, uh, and if I'm being bad, it'll be maybe a full fat Coke or something like that. Um, I, I do tend to, I do tend to do most of my uh, thought work with kind of a steady stream of caffeine. <laughs> okay. Um, you had mentioned you had a dog. Yes. Um, now, does your dog help you or hinder you when you are, are uh, writing? Yeah, she's, uh, well, first of all, I wrote my dog into Abbott and Darkness. So if you read Abbott and Darkness, Abbott's got a dog and the dog's name is Ani Moosh. Uh, Ani for short, that is my dog. The only difference <laughs> in the book, the dog changes colors with the seasons. My dog does not do that. She's just black. But uh uh but yeah she's she's uh um well so she knows her rights so in the morning if you get her up uh you can take her for a walk or you can you know give her some i mean there's the dry dog food and there's a the slightly nicer wet dog food right you can or you can give her wet dog food and either one of those things is okay but if you, you don't do one of them she will come she doesn't bite. She's very good, but she'll come kind of bump her face against you as if she's going to bite you. Right. So like her mouth's open. So you just kind of feel the front of her teeth, just kind of like little hard things on you. Right. Doesn't tear the skin, but just, I say, I, I, I use, I use the word boop. I say, she's booping me, she's booping me right? until, until you do it. Um, and especially she'll do that again in the evening uh, at about eight. So something about the quality of the sun how much time has passed, she knows, and she'll come and, and do that. And, and she will get really insistent. So uh, she, she will start barking and kind of jumping around and as you know, I'm, uh, you know, to, to move me into keeping my end of the bargain, taking her for a walk. Um, but uh, uh, other than that, she's only been uh, helpful. I take her out uh, hiking in the deserts in southern and eastern Utah or the mountains in, in kind of northeastern Utah uh, or the, the flats out in the Great Basin in the west um, on trips to do research. I like to go and immerse myself in terrain that I'm going to sort of write into my uh, books. And I do that with the dog. Um, I wrote her into uh, to Abbott and Darkness. I also wrote a picture book and gave it to my agent, which in, which is entirely in the dog's voice. Uh, I went out and um, it's it's a monologue in the dog's head as she's talking to me, giving me fashion advice is what it's about. And uh, so the my agent is not responding. It, it's entirely possible she'll say, "Dave, this is terrible. You, this I'm not going to take this anywhere." 
but uh, but if I'm lucky, you know, then maybe my dog uh, and I will be out on bookshelves together. Uh, it her name, like fun. <laughs> yeah, it, I thought it was pretty funny. My kids all laughed out loud. Um, her her name Ani Moosh is uh, is actually the uh, so Ojibwe is one of the biggest surviving Algonquian language. It's a Native American language. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got forty thousand speakers. I should say biggest surviving. Um, it's the second largest surviving native language north of the Rio Grande. South of the Rio Grande, there's a lot of big ones, but north of the Rio Grande, there's Navajo is number one, number two is Ojibwe. Animush means dog in Ojibwe, so her name is Dog. Uh, <laughs> Great. She's a good boy. <laughs> Okay, I have um, just two more questions for you. Um, one is, where can people find your work? Uh, aside from Annie's book, Stop of Worcester, of course, um, and, and people should definitely check Annie's first. And I'm going to give a little plug here. Um, you can get um, Dave's or DJ's um, books at uh, Annie's if you call 508-796-5613. Um, or you can you can email us at orders at Annie's books, Worcester.com. So where else can people find your books? Um, well, so uh, I've got 10 traditionally published novels and you can find those in any of the places that a traditionally published novel could be found. So uh, you can walk into, uh, if you walk into um, any large bookstore in the U.S., it's likely that something I've written is there. Not 100%, but pretty good chance at least one book is there. Um, and if not, they can certainly order them. But also, all, all of my stuff, and I've got a trilogy out under the name Dave Butler, which is for young for younger readers. The Kidnap Plot is the first book. Younger, uh, 10 to 14, maybe. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and then for adults under the name DJ Butler, uh, you, know, you know, an Amazon or a barnesandnoble.com or any kind of online bookstore will sell them to you. Uh, if you want to get a sort of a, see a list of them, you can come to my website, davidjohnbutler.com. I've got an H in John, davidjohnbutler.com. And you can, you can see my books there and they've got links so you can poke around and, and check them out. Okay. And um, how else can we follow your work and share your awesomeness? Oh, that is so that is so kind. You know, I'm actually really pulled back from social media. I was extremely active on Facebook and I have deleted my Facebook account. I had like 3000 friends and I've deleted the account. Um, so the easiest way to, to connect with me is my mailing list. Uh, and uh, so if you go to davidjohnbutler.com, one of the pages says something like follow follow Dave's writing or something like that. And that's where you can sign up for the mailing list. I, I send a most Monday mornings at 8 a.m. my time, I send out a list, uh, a mailing, an email to the list. Uh, like I said, uh, usually once or twice a month, I'm giving away free stuff. I also talk about what am I reading? What do I have coming out? What am I writing? Uh, I give little bits of writing and, and um, like, like actual writing, writing, but also writing career advice uh and uh i even asked questions this week i said i this is this is true i could not figure out cannot figure out still why my car stinks something inside my car reeks and i've tried everything and i emailed the list and i said i said anyone got any ideas what and i got back like six or seven suggestions on where to look to see if there's like a dead animal in the heat vent or you know whatever uh so i asked my i asked my list for advice on a stinking car and i'm going to go try and solve that problem next <laughs> okay oh, well good luck with that <laughs> and uh well, that's all i have for you dave and thank you so much for for joining us today and um hopefully when uh when covid gets uh you know completely better hopefully uh you'll be able to join us at the store that's my plan selena thank you very much okay well thanks very much and we'll be seeing you Okay, bye.